1994, uh, I would found myself in the Super Bowl. Uh, the biggest game in professional uh, football, in football, and probably the biggest game in some ways, of, unless you're a soccer fan, uh, <laughs> you know, biggest game in the world. Um, the night before the game, the PR guy came to me for the 49ers and put a contract in front of my face and said for $500, if I signed it, that I could be, uh, and, and the next day if I won the most valuable player in the game, that I would be the one that yelled into the camera at the end of the game, now that you're the MVP of the Super Bowl, what are you going to do? And you'd yell into the camera, I'm going to Disneyland, right? So for me, it was really exciting because it was like being on the Wheaties box. You know, it was like one of those things that I had grown up with, that I had all my heroes did. Um, it was something that I, you know, I, it was like an out-of-body experience, kind of like, oh my gosh, it's happening to me, but it's me watching me do this. It's, it was crazy. And so the next day, as it turned out in the game, I ended up being the MVP of the game. And I was so excited that we had won the game, uh, and that the pressure was off. I was more relieved than happy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if any of you have faced those kinds of things. I just, they, my dad, all the years that I played, he goes, just have fun. I'm like, <laughs> fun? <laughs> this is too much pressure to have fun. But we had won the game, and I was MVP, and I was just ecstatic. And the guy came to me who had come the night before. He said, don't remember, you have to yell under the camera. Uh, that you're going to Disneyland. And so I did. I, uh, I yelled in the camera, I'm going to Disneyland. And I thought, oh, that's a, the, the neatest thing that I'd ever even thought about doing. Uh, and so it was just like double great that uh, these things were happening. And then uh, later that night, uh, through the celebrations and so forth, he came to me again. He said, oh, by the way, that wasn't a metaphor. You actually, I don't know if you read the contract, but you actually have to go to Disneyland. <laughs> and you have to go tomorrow. Uh, and being the lawyer that I was, my wife's the only one that reads contracts. I don't read them. I just don't, I don't care about them. Uh, but uh, so there I did. I found myself in Miami, back to San Francisco, down in Anaheim. And many of you, have, I'm sure, enjoyed Disneyland. We, our family, are Disneyland um, fanatics. Uh, oh, it's, uh, if you knew, you would be scared of us. <laughs> and so we, uh, I found myself down there the next night in front of the castle. Let me set the stage. You know that uh, Walt built the Main Street so it's an optical illusion. It's much shorter than it looks like as he built the home so it looked like it was a much longer road, but it's actually very short. And in front of the castle was a huge float. Uh, with gold and red streamers, the colors of the 49ers, and on the side it said Steve Young, Super Bowl MVP. And on top was myself and Mickey Mouse. And in front was the Disneyland band. And I don't know, uh, you probably didn't know they had a band. They have a band. Uh, and so down Main Street we went. And you gotta remember, I have now come off one of the most euphoric experiences of my life. The night I just, everything had been relieved and I've been this wonderful feelings. And, and now I'm in California and Anaheim and at Disneyland, which I love with Mickey Mouse at my side, uh, <laughs> you know, and the band in front, and down Main Street we went, and people were just, in, you know, they were, look, loved the Super Bowl and everything, they were yelling, Steve, you're the man, Steve, you're the greatest, you're the king, you're the man, you know, Joe who, you know, it didn't really have <laughs> And I want to tell you that for about, uh, I think the break, for, I was really upset with Walt, because I really wanted it to be a longer, <laughs> you know, it was about, I want to say about six minutes. <laughs> it felt like about 30 seconds. But for those six minutes, I found myself kind of lost in the moment. And I started to yell back at them, I am the man. <laughs> I am the greatest. I am. You know, it's like lost my, my, I never would have thought that I would ever be in that situation. <laughs> So uh, very quickly the, the parade ended and the van turned to go backstage and the and it got kind of quiet and we started to turn and there I am standing and there's two little boys sitting on the curb uh, dressed alike like moms like to do so if they get lost uh, or they get found uh, six and eight years old and the six year old the younger one looks up and sees Mickey Mouse and he's like Mickey Mouse like right there there he is Mickey Mouse and he started to like mesmerize walk, walk towards the float. And before I could say anything or do anything for fear that he might get hurt, his brother grabbed him by the shirt, pulled him back and says, you can't get near him, 
the big guy won't let you. Uh, I, I had another out-of-body experience right there. Like, all of a sudden, everything crashed. And I suddenly was looking at this eight-year-old with some... I was just upset at him. Like, kid, look at the side of the float. Still young. Super Bowl MVP of all the times in my life that I am not Mickey Mouse's bodyguard, it is right now. <laughs> and I want you to honor, honor that. But it was, it was like many experiences in my life, uh, so many that I couldn't uh, share them all with you, that happened in the immediate, immediacy of the, of the moment that I reflect on for years and years, the, the impact that it had. I can still see the eight-year-old. I can still see the red shirts. I can still see the Levi's. I can still see what he said. And I, and I, I see it so clearly because of how it affected me. Because I immediately realized that, yes, I had made it to the top of Everest. But that there it was six minutes later, and I, w I had another role to play and another perception to, 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 to uh, deal with. And I realized that humility, for me, um, is sometimes forced. Uh, a lot of times, uh, I, I think it should be worn like our favorite pair of shoes. Humility is, to me, one of the uh, most uh, important pieces of, of my life. Sometimes it is served cold, but regardless, humility should be our home base, the place we are always connected to, through the dregs of affliction, um, or placing the flag on the top of Everest. I, I, I need humility to find God's purpose in all those moments in our lives, from the top to the bottom. Not worldly humility, but godly humility. God is in control, has a plan, and I'm capable in every way to come to that, to know it, humility. I'll always be grateful for that little six-year-old uh, and eight-year-old to kind of more vividly remind me of that. I walked in earlier here, and someone stood next to me and said, oh, you're, you're not as tall as I thought. <laughs> I get that a lot. Uh, I'm only six feet. Uh, six, uh, uh, three quarters, my wife says. Six and three quarters. Uh, I, um, I put down when I first turned pro, they have you fill out a sheet, uh, information sheet about yourself so that all the playing cards can be, you know, if you have playing cards in football on the back, it'll say all your statistics and your height and your weight, and I put down six two. Because that's what I truly felt that I was. <laughs> I just, I, you, know, you know what I'm talking about in some place in your life. Uh, that, and, and, and so if you have a football card of mine through the years, and I even go home, if you have one, you look in the back, it'll say 6'2", 210. Because that's what I wrote down. And I truly believed it until uh, uh, I was measured, uh, uh, and I and I didn't get on my toes, and I had to. It was like an official thing, and they said you're six feet three quarters, and I should have most honorably gone back and fixed it on the football cards, but I just I just couldn't. <laughs> I just love the thought of being six two. Uh, I still do actually. <laughs> what a helmet! I was six two. But, uh, <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, when you're on the football field, um, there's not a lot of people that are six feet. There's a lot of people that are six six, even six seven, even six eight. Um, some of the guys that I played with, quarterbacks like John Elway and Troy Aikman and um, uh, Dan Marino, uh, they were all six five or six six. And I always thought it was so unfair that they were able to kind of look over the mountain and see the valley and, and could tell what was going on, where uh, many times I just could see like the top of Tim, you know, and, and the clouds. <laughs> um, but even today, Peyton Manning and Tom Brady are 6'6". Six, six. Even Peyton Manning, I think, is almost 6'7". Um, and so the way that that played out in my life was that I would be on the field, and I would drop back a pass, and because I didn't have the visibility, a lot of times I literally couldn't see. And early in my career, I didn't know what to do about that. I would, um, I would start to run, and then I'd get tackled, and then all everyone would yell at me and my coach would say, well, you know, why didn't you, know, why didn't you throw the ball? The receiver, Jerry Rice, was open. Why didn't you throw it to him? And I would tell him I couldn't see him. And then he had the great comeback uh, that I think parents and I find myself doing in my son very typically. He said to me, well, you better start seeing him. 
<laughs> and, uh, I said, that's great. Um, I'll tell you what. Uh, why don't you point them out? And I'll look at you, and then we'll see them together. Uh, and then we'll all be happy. Uh, you know, I didn't know what to do about it, because I kept hearing that. And he kept saying, if you don't put this together, you can't play. And I thought, uh, how many times I wish that I was 6'2 or 6'4, especially then. But I knew I was full grown. I knew that I wasn't going to grow any taller. I couldn't wear, um, you know, stilts or springs on my feet and jump up and look. There was just, and I thought about this. What can I do to be taller? What can I, what possibly, I thought about wearing like cleats that were extra long so that they somehow gave me a little lift. And some, I, I walk on my toes anyway. I thought I'd just play on my toes. Um, but it really didn't make a, uh, that much of a difference. Um, and so I didn't know what to do other than I thought, you know, I just saw Jerry Rice. I know where he's going. I better just throw it anyway. <laughs> on gut instinct. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I did that. And, I, and, I, and there was a first few times, if you've ever done anything um, uh, metaphysical like that, where you have some part of you that's too short, and you're now going to reach beyond what you think is possible, and take a chance. Um, that's what I did. And uh, the first few times, the passes were very inaccurate. But they were being caught, a lot of them. But I was known for throwing passes right here. That was kind of my specialty. And um, so I wanted to go to Jerry Rice and tell him, Jerry, um, I'm throwing the passes very inaccurately right now because I'm going through this metaphysical process of learning to throw the ball blind. <laughs> and uh, I want you to understand that uh, the passes that you were getting that are a little inaccurate, they're passes that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. These are like extra special. And, uh, and he looked at me and, and just deadpan said, well, you know what, just put it right here. Um, because I found that in the efforts that I was making around growing, um, beyond myself, and I really, this is a faithful journey for me to deliver passes in front of 80,000 people without really knowing, without really being sure. How many times do you, you really do want to see? And I can tell you in the football field, you just, you dream. Many times I'd say, people would say, well, who's your favorite receiver? And I say, it's the open receiver. You know, it's the one that I can see and throw the ball to because I am desperate in desperate ways because I'm literally being, I'm under attack. And if I don't do something fast, I'm finished. And so please let me see something, that a flash of a color or something that I can throw the football. And when you don't see it and you still throw it, um, I really thought, thought that's one of the like, more precious um, experiences of my life. In fact, people will say to me, Steve, what is your, uh, some of your favorite, most searing memories of playing all those years? It must be championships or Super Bowls or great moments. And I do remember them, but the searing memories for me are the moments of throwing the ball blind uh, that I remember vividly. Um, one of my favorites was to win a game, and I threw a long one blindly, and I was at the bottom of a pile. And, 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 and just as I threw it, I got hit, and, and about 350 pounds, or well, that's another thing. When linemen, um, <laughs> when linemen write down their football cards when they're rookies. Um, they run like 6'6", 320, but the 320 is code for 420. <laughs> just like my 6'2 is code for six foot. So just in case you see someone else's card, you, you know how that works. So on top of me, so I've thrown the ball, I'm blindly throwing it in front of 80,000 people, and, and they're, they're screaming and yelling against us because it's on the road. And I throw it, and I get hit and knocked to the ground, and people pile on top of me. And all of a sudden, I heard everyone go quiet. You know, 80,000 people just silent. And, um, uh, uh, and I thought to myself, you know, oh my gosh, this is the greatest moment of, of my career. Uh, the, the, this false, you know, I could hear about 50 people over there kind of, you know, my teammates going, woo, 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 but it was just <laughs> silent. And it was just a, a wonderful experience. And so I remember those moments so vividly. And I can tell you that the next day after I would uh, have throw passes like that, there was never anything in the paper that said, Steve Young throws blind. You know, um, <laughs> they never had anything that, you know, celebrated this thing that I was going through 
that was so um, revealing and, uh, and was based fundamentally in faith. And so I can tell you that um, uh, the, the greatest things that I can think of that I've done have been powered in some way by faith. Um, kind of throwing without knowing, I would call it. Throwing on faith. This, uh, you know, like so many experiences in my life has taught me to recognize faith is the fundamental fuel for the human experience. It's, it's, it's just been proven to me so many times. And that if the, if the experience is to return to our Heavenly Father, faith is the fuel from the beginning to the end. It's just, it's, it's the power. And so becoming that faithful person is the beginning, the middle, and the end. I, I appreciate that experience of throwing the ball blind for teaching me to be more faithful in a Savior instead of more fearful. I have grown throughout my years with some anxieties. Um, when I was little, I didn't leave home very often. I would many times, when my parents are here, uh, uh, it, going, you know, f to scout camp or going to, you know, even to college was a death-defying experience. And so fear and anxieties are kind of uh, innate to me. And so having faith overcoming those kinds of things um, really vital to me. Uh, Elder Jeffrey Holland this last April said, do not start your quest for faith by saying how much you do not have, leading as it were with your unbelief. Honestly acknowledge your questions and your concerns, but first and forever fan the flame of your faith because all things are possible to them that believe. Faithful actions create their own momentum. Doubting is necessary opposition to faith. Or as a favorite local scribe, Robert Kirby, wrote recently, doubt can have the same effect as nuclear warfare in terms of what it can do to your life if you're not careful. Doubting isn't bad. It's actually healthy. It can be educational, but it also can lead to destruction if you let it overtake your ability to have faith. The trick is in recognizing where doubt is taking you so you can manage it rather than letting it manage you. Close quote. Throwing blind was full of doubt, but doubt couldn't have won sway, or I couldn't have done it. I grew by faith. I was taller. We are all too short at something. We are all six foot three quarters. <laughs> but it's gritty faith in Jesus Christ is my stake in the ground. Doubts come as I drop back to pass, but I always throw in faith. So whether at the top of the mountain or the dregs of affliction, ready to learn and to grow, and then have a deep, steely faith in the Savior to believe he can do what he said he can do. I'm just a run-of-the-mill Latter-day Saint. I grew up listening to Saturday's Warriors as I did my homework. I crinkled all my pages in the quad for Scripture Chase on Super Saturdays for Sunday. I didn't just crinkle the ones that had the Scripture. But through all the challenges, ups and downs, I'm grateful for the Gospel, for the salve that it is for me, and has been throughout my life. I really am grateful for the opportunity to speak to you, to share my faith, and to encourage all of us to seek the supernal gift of charity or the pure love of Christ in this life. This charity is gained by praying unto the Father with all the energy of heart, that ye may be filled with this love, which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified even as he is pure. This charity is to see each one of us as Jesus sees us. What a fantastic promise and gift charity is, a literal endowment from our Heavenly Father for loving his Son. We can have this charity. We need to see each other for the eternal beings that we are, and for the eternal potential that we have. I'm here to bear my testimony in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and to simply say that I'm a Mormon and I want to build bridges of understanding with my gay brothers and sisters. I consider you my friends. Let's seek to develop more love for each other wherever we can. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.